I didn't go to college. I was gonna go, but then I got The Outsiders. Am I gonna do The Outsiders with Francis Ford Coppola? Or am I gonna go to freshman year at UCLA, USC? I think it shows okay. Hi, I'm Rob Lowe, and this is the timeline of my career. My first big job, I was 15. I had a David Cassidy hairdo, although my brother Chad likes to say that I, my hairdo looked more like Karen Carpenter's. It's a look. I had my first girlfriend, and in the summers I would have to go back to Ohio to visit my dad, because my parents were divorced. I had to go away for the summer, and I was so heartbroken. My agents called, and they were like, yeah, there's a, an audition. If you want to pay your own fare and fly back for it, yes, I'll do it. I could have cared less. The only real reason I came back is because I wanted to see the girl. Well, I got it. I learned a lot about comedy from Eileen Brennan, who played my mom, and she was just coming off of Private Benjamin, where she was nominated for an Oscar. We shot a bunch of shows and weren't on the air. Then all of a sudden, we were on the air and did our next show, and when I came out, the girls screamed in the audience. We'd been on the air one week, and I thought, wait a minute, I'm still the dweeb that couldn't get a date in high school. It's the power of entertainment. It was a horrible bomb. There were 62 shows on television. You're looking at number 62. Dead last. And the network's big fix. Literally, you turn it on one Friday and there was just a new family living there. Didn't work. But here's the good news. The daughter, Janet Jackson. Miss Jackson, if you're nasty. For what? No bra, no brain. Derry, have you seen my DX shirt somewhere? Hey, you gotta wear a no. pants too, buddy. Hey, there's a dollar still not dead. How about my jeans? I was still new enough that I didn't realize how unique it was. Coppola had all of the actors auditioning come at the same time to a soundstage that he had bought. And we would all sit on the floor and we would play characters and then he would send one down and have somebody come up and change characters and we all watched each other. And then it went on like this 12 hours a day for days. I don't know if the best actors got the parts, but I will tell you that for sure the most competitive and the toughest ones did. Kill or be killed. When we got the movie, there was a ton of prep. Francis would create a world for us. He would have us go and sleep overnight for nights with these greaser families. And so it's me and Tom Cruise in a guest bedroom in some bad area of Tulsa, Oklahoma with some people who are high school delinquents. Francis wanted to toughen us up. So he had us play tackle football on the asphalt with like the local gang o thugs. Tommy Howell being the most sophisticated one of all of us, and he was all 13, huddled us up and he says, I don't know about you, but I'm out of here. If I break my leg on this play, they'll have somebody else playing Pony Boy tomorrow. And we sort of boycotted it and walked off. <laughs> endless, endless, endless training for the Rumble. It was my first time learning a stunt and we had the great buddy Joe Hooker, probably the first iconic stuntman. Each one of us got to sort of choreograph our own version of the fight that we would work on relentlessly. The day we went to shoot it was a massive torrential rainstorm. Francis said, I'll just shoot in the rain. And then the rain stopped, so for the next week we had to bring in fake rain. God, just those nights under that rain and that mud. I mean, it wasn't apocalypse now, but it was as close as we were gonna get. Every seventh grader in the country pretty much is required to read the book. And of course, they see the movie. So every year I get 13-year-olds who lose their mind. That is an amazing gift as an actor. I'll always kind of be frozen in time. It's really special, I have to say. You know what it is? It's St. Elmo's fire. Electric flashes of light that appear in dark skies out of nowhere. <laughs> to be barely 21, being able to make movies with people you loved, and the movies were about us hanging out, so all we did was hang out. The part I played was the part of Billy. I know a good part when I read one, but they didn't want me for that part. They wanted me to play the straight square part that Judd Nelson played, because they didn't think I was edgy enough. So I spent the next 20 years of my life proving them wrong. I showed up for my meeting with Joel Schumacher with like a six pack of beer, and he was like, oh, this guy's edgy enough, and I, and I got that part. That's not a, a, an easy speech. It's so earnest. And also the meaning of St. Elmo's Fire is all like wacky. Sailors would guide entire journeys by it. Sailors thought it was the things that 
appeared on the mast of ships, but it's not. It's the things that appear on the, it's like, ah. Uh, but I think I did it okay. I made it up because they thought they needed it to keep them going and things got tough. Those movies still have a, a meaning, which I'm shocked at, really. Something like Stranger Things, for example, and you go, oh, yeah, that's, that's based on my character from St. Elmo's Fire. The year that that came out, I remember going out for Halloween and seeing multiple people dressed as my character. Weird and awesome. By the way, the only reason I knew were my characters, they had a saxophone around their necks and a bad wig. I followed like Clarence Clemens around from the E Street Band. Usually it's worn right here, but mine's worn like a guitar and I can throw it over my back. It's a guitar strap. It's hilarious. It's so good. Yeah, the sax scene's my favorite. I can fake play the sax to this day. I'm better at fake doing everything. Welcome to Club Sprocket Chen. Thank you, Dieter. If you'd have told me that I would host Saturday Night Live one day, I'd be like, get out of here. It was the highlight. And frankly, it remains. One of the greatest compliments I ever got was from Mike Myers, who said that I should have been a not ready for primetime player. Me and Alec Baldwin. And I would have loved that. Lauren likes to just describe hosting it as being, it's like being shot out of a cannon. I mean, the adrenaline when they announce you and you come out and it's that iconic stage and they're playing that iconic opening music. In terms of rushes, I don't know if I've ever topped that. The real collaboration I have was with Mike Myers. He was either gonna do a Wayne's World sketch or Sprockets. And I was like, I'm not a big Wayne's World fan. Little did I know. And I played ATN, the pansexual choreographer. It was heaven. Mike and I had such a good time that when he wrote Wayne's World, um, he wrote me into it, purely because of that. I know that I may be wasting my time, but here I am with the contract and two cashier's checks for $5,000 each. Mike and Dana had never been in a movie. They didn't know where to stand in front of a camera. I'm not kidding. And Paramount was like, yeah, whatever, sure, Lorne, here's some chump change, go make your little whatever. And I sat in a screening and Bohemian Rhapsody came on. And when they started moving their heads like this, the place went ballistic like I've never seen before. And I remember looking at Mike and looking at each other and going, holy shit. And literally the rest was history. Benjamin was a, a really, really fun character for me to do and started my mini career as a good looking comic dick. I was just so excited to, to, to be allowed to be funny. And then as it grew into Tommy Boy and Austin Powers, it was a chance to use a muscle that I hadn't had a chance to. I mean, About Last Night and St. Elmo's Fire have comedy in them, but they're not comedy comedy, so it was, it was pretty fun. Yeah. You're fired. Guys, come on. Can you believe John Smith is getting married tomorrow? I'm uncredited in Tommy Boy, and the first Austin. Well, you know he works as a henchman for Dr. Evil. Because that's literally a cameo in the very first Austin. I think it's only in the extended DVD cut. Mike and I, as I said, were friends and we were playing golf one day. I grew up with Robert Wagner. I knew his daughters and we started talking about RJ, as he's called, and I imitated him. And Mike lost his mind. We laughed about it and that was it. And six months later, he sent me Austin Powers, the spy who shagged me. And there I am in the script, young number two, played by Rob Lowe. First of all, Dr. Evil's my favorite character in cinema history. The globe was there. When we were screwing around, I would, I would dribble it like a basketball. And it got me thinking, and I went to Mike, and I said, hey Mike, do you remember the great Santini? And Mike's a cinemaphile like me, and that's a great movie with Robert Duvall. He plays a bastard father, and he's making his son play basketball. I bet you're gonna cry. Come on, mama's boy. Let's see you cry, come on. Squirt if you, come on, cry. And I was like, we should do Great Santini where you throw the ball off my head. We only did it once. We did it in one take as an ad lib, and it made it into the movie. Huh? You gonna cry? You gonna cry? You gonna cry? Huh? Huh? What are you? Huh? You're gonna squirt some? You gonna cry? Huh? Huh? Yeah, see, you're gonna cry, huh? You're a big man now, huh? Yeah. Thought so. There's a woman over there. I think she's looking at me. Really? I don't know. I never know if they're looking or not. When I read the title, West Wing, I thought it was a sequel to Pensacola Wings of Gold. No idea what the hell it was. I've never really had this in my career, ever. I was like, oh, I'm this guy.
that's all fine and good for me to feel that way. The question is, what does everybody else think? And I vaguely knew the name Aaron Sorkin. Aaron, to this day, has you come in and read because his writing's very specific and you can either do it or you can't. They offered me the part in the parking lot. I clearly had a connection that I had a conversation with a very famous actor who was going to maybe do newsroom. Do you have to say everything that he, I'm like, yeah. But so wait, so like, I can't like, you know, like make it my own. I'm like, dude, you're not making it your own. Why, why would I ever want to do that? I'm like, because the beauty of it is the math, being able to, to be in the orchestra, to know your place, to play your notes. I remember the audition, like I knew it cold, comma, letter, perfect. I mean, Aaron's just a guy who writes great stuff. I do think though, coming off of that comedy run I was on, got me the part. It was the very first scene in the pilot. And when I was done, everybody laughed. And Aaron turned to the network and said, I told you the scene was funny. It was a unwritten rule of show business. You do not do a show about politics. Only because Aaron wrote such a good script did they even consider it. And even then it sat literally in a desk until Scott Sassa, the then president of NBC, goes, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Now there are 10 political shows on every single network. Remember that it is not the DNC, but rather your tax dollars that pay my salary. So I work for you, whether you voted for us or not. My body has no fat to protect itself from disease. Things happen very quickly. Listen to me. It's very important that you replenish my body with electrolytes after every involuntary loss of bodily fluids. Oh boy. So there was a notion that they were gonna add a character to 30 Rock, my favorite show ever. And that I would be a, a nemesis to Alec. And I don't think it was ever a real conversation, but it sparked the network saying, I don't know about that, but would Rob ever consider going on Parks and Recreation? It was a total shotgun marriage. I met Mike Schur, Mike met me, and it was literally a blind date. Literally, see, I said it. And I remember Amy just happened to walk in. You know, it was a love fest from the minute from go. Mike, understandably, didn't know if it would, was gonna fit, and frankly, neither did I. So we kind of agreed that we would do a six episode trial. But because Amy was pregnant, it was really this convoluted schedule where it's really crazy. We decided really, really early that it was great and we all wanted to do it. And I remember the day that it happened. We were doing an episode that's called the flu episode where he gets very, very sick and he looks in the mirror and says, stop pooping. And that's an ad lib. And when I looked in the mirror and ad libbed that, I think Mike sure was like, we're keeping him. That staff was insane. It's like the 1927 New York Yankees, murderer's row. Everybody on the show is a steroided version of who they actually are. I do have a little bit of energy and I, I am kind of optimistic and I am kind of enthusiastic and they just mainlined it. So much so that seasons end playing Chris, I was like, I wonder if there's just other layers to Chris. Nope, there's none. That Chris could be excited about the most mundane, boring thing. It just was a well that never ran dry, but now, I am infected with the killer virus, and I feel fine. Therapy! Now I've got to go back home, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do with myself. Maybe you're doing it here. The thought of going to Africa and shooting a movie legitimately in the wilds of Africa with real wild animals that are not trained, they're not being told what to do. Do you want to shoot a movie in Africa? Because you don't even need to read it, yes. In because you know it's gonna be an adventure. And I love Kristen Davis. First of all, she looks exactly the same. She's beautiful and is nice and wonderful and she's just a, just a great person. If I didn't have, have her there, I don't know what I would have done because it's such a specific life. Living in Africa, giving your whole life to elephants and living in a tent. And Unlike the West Wing where I've lived part of that life, there's no iteration of me that's ever lived that. She was invaluable to me. I'm outdoors almost every minute of every day that I can be outdoors. I love being outdoors. And to, to be there and that kind of majesty and to be making a movie there, it was surreal. And it's the kind of things that you know you're not gonna get a chance to do maybe ever again in your life. I ran as fast as I could from that dust cloud. 20 years later, it's finally catching up to me. Pack your things. You're getting out of town. I remember turning on my TV and seeing this show Nip Tuck and seeing this character 
Dr. Christian Troy and turning to my wife and going, why can't I have a character like that? That's what I should be playing. And I had a meeting with Ryan and I told him about how much I loved Dr. Christian Troy and he was getting whiter and whiter and whiter as I was talking. And I said, what's wrong? He goes, don't you know I wrote it for you? He wrote it for me and my agents never gave it to me. So since that day, we've been trying to figure out how to work together. And this is the good news. I've had a show on the air every season since 1999. Finally, I was available when he wanted to do a new iteration of, of his 911 franchise. It's big, it's massive, it's gritty, it's a great part, great cast, Liv Tyler. I feel like I'm, I'm part of a big train. I play a, a, a firefighter who's obsessed with his hair, his skincare regimen. That's such a, like a Brad Falchuk, Ryan Murphy, Tim Minear kind of thing. They have a weird secret sauce and it's that kind of bizarre, like you're not quite sure how they actually get away with it. That's the brand and they've done it and it's really fun. Hey, fall back, fall back! I'm grateful that I'm able to do both, that I can, have shows on the air that are out and out comedy like Parks or to, and to do, you know, Lone Star, which is out and out action drama. Even the mistakes or the things that don't turn out the way you maybe you want to inevitably lead you into something bigger and better. And that's been my experience, not only professionally, but personally. I'm glad because I've always had a sense of purpose about my life. I'm really fortunate.